Just want to get our phone. Yeah, okay. we'll be back then. We'll still be on Harvard time. We have 170 people registered for a Zoom. So you've got a sizable audience for the <laughs> Okay, well, let's get started. Um, welcome, everyone, to today's Critical Issues Confronting China program. And thank you all so much for joining us today. We're uh, excited to tell you that we've got 170 people signing who signed in on uh, online as well. So um, you guys draw a big audience. We're really grateful for that. Well, after last week's party congress, we certainly all know that Xi Jinping is in charge. Uh, so now the question, is, of course, is how is he going to revive the economy? She made it clear that houses are meant for living in, not for speculation. So given that housing and speculation were such important drivers of the economy, now what? Today, we are so thrilled to have one of the, to be hosting one of the world's best minds on this subject, Professor Kenneth Rogoff, who's done deep analysis on the subject and 
co-authored, recently co-authored a paper for the IFF. Um, I am Dinda Elliott. Sorry, I'm a little breath breathless. I just ran up and down some stairs. <laughs> I'm executive director of the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies. And our mission, as you know, is to support dialogue and uh, research around China. And uh, perhaps especially given the current increasingly anti-China environment here in the US, we continue to believe in the importance of open dialogue and discussion. Uh, and though it's getting tougher and tougher given some of the domestic pressures in China, we will continue to strive to bring both Western and Chinese voices to our Harvard audience so that we can study today's challenges from all angles. Um, so the speaker series, of course, as you know, was founded by Professor Ezra Vogel, who believed deeply in the idea of intellectual exchange. And uh, inspired by that vision, we invite speakers from all corners to share their insights on the latest uh, about China. So before we dive into today's program, just very quickly, I wanted to give a little plug for a few upcoming talks as well. Um, I hope you'll all come to those too. Next Wednesday, we have Winston Ma Wenyan, a China digital expert who's gonna be talking about China's cryptocurrency policies. And the following Wednesday, Wall Street Journal reporter Wei Ling Ling uh, will talk with us about how the private sector is dealing with Xi Jinping's state-driven policies. Um, so now on to today's program, I'd like to uh, introduce our moderator, Professor David Yang, whose research focuses on political economy, behavioral and experimental econ economics, economic history, and cultural economics. Professor Yang will introduce our speaker today, and then following the talk, he will moderate a conversation and questions from the audience. So um, think about your questions as they, as they speak. So over to you, Professor Yang. Thanks so much. Hi, great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Professor Ken Brock, but he's the um, Merit Symbolist Chair of International Economics at Harvard and was the new economist I had from uh, 2001 to 2003. Ken is a member of the National Academy of Science at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and is one of the most cited economists in our field. Probably the most impressive economist in the world, Ken is also an uh, international grandmaster of tests. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, real estate uh, sector in China. So kind of thirty percent of China's GDP falls into real estate, much larger than the United States and many other developed countries. So Ken and his collaborator has uh, have worked on several important pieces of understanding the, the real estate sector in China. And uh, today he's going to tell us about the extent to which the sector's boom and the bubble. Goes above and beyond the tier one, tier two, which is where the sellers, sellers have most of the time. Hear about the tier of tier three six. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and to all of you who are here in person, and to the online audience. And I just want to start by. Uh, uh, sharing uh, the director's uh, sentiment that I think it's very important to have open dialogue between the U.S. and China, and that uh, that concerns me a lot uh, to see that uh, to the extent that that's become, become it might become more difficult. I, I, th I think the U.S. and China are clearly the two most important countries of the 21st century and need to find uh, ways to communicate. And I, I think under virtually any circumstances, it's important to have a scholarly exchange and discussion. Um, so let me uh, start out by saying uh, I'm uh, the work on which my comments are based is uh, enormous, it is a joint with Yuan Chen Yang, who uh, was at Tsinghua, visited Harvard when we did our first papers, now at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, however, uh, the views expressed in my comments are mine and mine alone. Uh, she is not guilty of any mistakes I make, which I'm sure I will, nor uh, of any um, uh, overly strong statements that I might make uh, that our paper makes in very new, uh, nuanced ways and certainly do not reflect the views of the International Monetary Fund. So uh, 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 I think I've made that clear. 
So this this paper ha- does have the title, The Tale of Tier 3 Cities, as uh, David said. Well, it's not advancing the slides. Um, apologies. I have to see it's not just in the economic <laughs> department. No, well, it just does not like me. Yeah, I wasn't able to do it with the keyboard either. Mm-hmm. I apologize. No worries. You can just use that. Oh. You. Amazing. Amazing. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyway, um, so I, before I talk about the paper that we finished quite recently, they're both National Bureau of Economic Research papers, a 2020 paper and a uh, 2000 and this 2022 paper. I want to talk a little bit about our our first paper called Peak China Housing. The point of that, I think, is pretty clear. Uh, And there there were actually uh, a number of academic papers written, which we cite uh, in both papers written before us. Um, Although I must say it had been many years in between the last paper and when we wrote our paper. And China, as you know, moves very fast. And so four or five years can can make a big difference. But I would say I'd say a theme of the papers, for example, the paper that my colleagues Ed Glazer and Andre Schleifer did in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, I think it was 2017 and based on 2013 data, sort of the conclusion, boy, prices are going up really fast, but probably they can manage it under most circumstances, whatever goes on. And I think that that was a theme of the previous literature. Uh, and I think a lot of the more sanguine conclusion was that the problem was manageable because you couldn't have a Western style banking crisis in an economy where the government kind of controls everything, which which doesn't mean houses couldn't be underwater in a sense, but it means that instead of taking years and years to go to court and to work everything out about who bears the burden, that the Chinese government in principle could do accelerated bankruptcy, could do things much more uh, quickly and efficiently. Um, so uh, we our, our, our paper uh, came to a different view. And we didn't say that it would have a financial crisis, although I think that's absolutely possible in the broader sense of the term. Uh, what we, we, we had a couple of points. One is the Chinese uh, housing sector is actually quite big in the economy if you take into account direct and indirect effects. So if you just looked at construction uh, and real estate, which counts commercial real estate, something like 70% of construction, it's it's a sizable number. I'll show you in a second. But you want to take into account the cement, the steel, the banking services, uh, the property management services, uh, real estate sales, all these things. You get a much bigger number 
and you get a much bigger number for China than you get uh, for most countries. So uh, we came to the conclusion that housing accounted, uh, depending on whether you look at final demand or input, if you're looking at the domestic inputs, 23% of GDP indirect and direct. But if you counted the important con imported contact, imported content, which would constitute final demand, it was larger, more on the order of 26%. Um, uh, when we gave these estimates, they were much larger than had been out there. It was just a different way of looking at things. They were much larger than had been out there. I would say, by and large, the academic literature and policy literature has moved around to our estimates. Uh, I did notice that in the World Economic Outlook, they gave uh, 20 percent as their estimate, and the Economist magazine cited that or used that number. I don't, honestly don't know where it came from, because if you just did the construction number, you got a number like 12 percent. But if you do the direct and indirect, you got more like 23 percent, maybe in some years, 22. Maybe they rounded it down. Um, it's also true that The Economist magazine uh, published an article about our article uh, quoting economists, the Asian Development Bank, who had arrived at a much smaller number, like 13 or 14 percent. I just have no idea where that came from. Uh, that was intended to include direct and indirect. I think the Asian Development Bank has since corrected themselves, although The Economist did not. Um, so, I, as I mentioned, the total domestic share of real estate in China's GDP uh, is, is big, but it's actually bigger than Spain and Ireland just before they had a crisis. This is something we looked at in our earlier paper. Um, obviously, it's a major engine of growth. And when you read that China's doing stimulus, a, a very large part of it refers to real estate because real estate, again, combining housing and construction, uh, com combining housing and, and commercials, a very large share of total construction. And in this newer paper, we actually bring in infrastructure as part of the uh, part of the, the thinking about it. Uh, and, and so uh, our basic thesis, and I'll come to it, you know, and I'll show you a few slides uh, in a second, um, is that the, um, it's not just that the housing sector is big. There's been too much focus on that. It's that it's big and it's been big for a long time. And they have just built a lot of real estate at this point. I mean, I suspect many in this audience uh, have been to China and seen the amazing infrastructure all over the place. And it is absolutely amazing. But I, I think our basic thesis is that you even so you run into diminishing returns. And in a way, there's a parallel between what's going on in China and what happened in Russia, uh, the old former Soviet Union, what happened in Japan. The Soviet Union built steel mills and they were really good at building rail railroads and steel mills. But then after a while, there were diminishing returns. And Japan, it was, it was actually infrastructure. And they started building the famous bridges to nowhere and that was preceded uh, their crash. So uh, uh, in the newer paper, we've updated our calculations through 2017. I won't, uh, through 2021, the original one went through 2017. Um, and I won't dwell on this, but you can sort of see, for example, in the 2021 numbers, if you're adding just the direct real estate activity being real estate services and construction, it's actually not such a big number. It's about 12%. It's a large number. But when you do the indirect and direct, you get something much larger. Um, my luck ran out with advancing this, oh, but I was able to do it another way. So this is a figure uh, from our first paper. Uh, we've done further work on this, where we constructed measures of living space per capita for China and compared it to other major countries. And this is this is actually a very important part of our argument. It's not all that they have a big construction sector. It's how much is there. So this doesn't capture commercial real estate. It doesn't uh, capture um, it doesn't capture uh, infrastructure. 
but it does have housing and it's a measure of square meters per person. We give in detail in the paper how we calculated it. It's, it's actually difficult to make exactly comparable numbers across countries because, for example, the way that different countries count interior walls and apartment buildings is different. But I think no matter how you slice it, China, it's really striking for a what are still uh, a middle income or uh, country uh, has uh, housing per capita comparable to the UK uh, and France and Spain. It's really stunning. So this is a central part of our argument. It's actually maybe the most original point we're making in the work, uh, but it's a part of a argument that you built a lot and you could be running into diminishing returns. When we uh, uh, first, uh, presented our paper, um, we got the response, what are you talking about? Prices in Shenzhen are soaring. Uh, real estate demand is huge because actually almost all the academic work focused on tier one and tier two cities. So I'll get to talking a little bit more about what I mean by that. But tier one, are there's actually no official categorization. We define it in the paper, but tier one are sort of the marquee cities, the uh, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Beijing, and Shanghai. And then there are the tier two cities. Again, this is unofficial of the provincial capitals, a few state controls, uh, and a, a few uh, nationally controlled uh, uh, cities, such as Shenzhen, um, that are larger and richer than the uh, than most of the smaller cities. Um, but the point of this paper is that actually a lot of the problems in these poor and smaller, I use the word small in parentheses, like small can still be many million people in China. Uh, uh, the equivalent of a tier three city in the United States, I guess, not to pick on Ohio, but maybe it would be Cincinnati with 300,000 people or Rochester where I grew up with 300,000 people. But if you look at these uh, uh, smaller cities, they, a lot of the, what we view as the, and we'll give you some measures, is the excess construction has taken place in these cities. Uh, it's, uh, I'll, I'll come back to talking about that more. So uh, just a little background still from our first paper that if you look at Western style housing prices, uh, the, they're at the epicenter. This is a graph from my book uh, with Carmen Reinhardt showing price collapses in uh, uh, that in housing price collapses and how many years uh, it took uh, uh, from peak to trough. Uh, the, the, this is from 2009. Some of these went on after that. Uh, again, I've said that that we shouldn't assume China has that kind of crisis. Actually, my book with Reinhardt has two kinds of crises, type one and type two. We call the type two crises these, but there is a type one where it's the government kind of owns everything. I don't know if we probably are going to need a type three for China when it happens. Um, okay, so this is a great, this is very familiar to all of you. Uh, the next couple of things I'm showing, but maybe a few of you it's not. If you think we had a big run up in prices in the United States before 2008, where you know by the by some measures it went up 60 percent the price, the K Schiller index, uh, for example, and then collapsed 36 <laughs> percent. The growth in the tier one cities was by a factor of five in China. And even in the, we break it down here and the paper discusses how we construct it. But if you break it down for the smaller cities, it's, it's still pretty substantial, but it's stunning. And of course it translates into just incredibly expensive housing by international measures. This is giving uh, price to income ratios. And you can see China accounts for three of the four most expensive cities. Um, so just to give like Beijing here is uh, over 45%. We're in Boston. I, I think the number in Boston is 12% and we're considered one of the most expensive cities. And San Francisco is sort of hanging around about the same. Now, th there, there are definitely some factors that exacerbate this. For example, uh, the Chinese government limits what you can put your money in. 
So a lot of money goes into housing. That's what you're allowed to buy. And that's one of the factors, but it's also true. And that's going to be an important point I'm going to come to that China is the country of the future. It's growing like crazy. And I've certainly heard many people and I'm probably you have too, you know, say, why shouldn't the price of housing in Shanghai or Beijing cost as much as the price of housing in London? Uh, It's going to be an equally important city, even if it's not, you know, even if it hasn't gotten there per capita income uh, today. Uh, You got a similar thing if you're looking at uh, price to rents. Um, So um, there was, this gives, uh, uh, housing, our estimates of housing price uh, just before the pandemic. And I have to sort of note that it was slight, there, it, it was much flatter in the tier one and tier two cities, although they had boomed somewhat before the pandemic. Um, one of the reasons that it's often said that, well, you know, it won't be a financial problem, is you need to put a big down payment on China uh, on your house. So, first of all, these, this is BIS numbers. That amount has still gone up. The uh, household borrowing, uh, household leverage ratios in China has gone up, and there are probably a lot of off-the-books borrowing that's hard to capture from the shadow banks uh, and such. Um, and then making the point that I don't need to tell you China's growth is slowing down. Uh, I've been speculating on this for years, actually. I was uh, had the honor of being a speaker at the big opening panel at the um, uh, China has this uh, uh, big economic forum after their uh, party congress. And I was the speaker back in 2016 and said, I, I don't see you know, how your growth is going to continue given you're catching up to the frontier demographics are terrible. Um, you, I, I, you, you're already catching up to the frontier, so it's hard to keep doing that. Uh, and uh, you have this real estate problem, which I hadn't done this research with Yuan Chen yet, but think was starting to think about. Uh, and then I, I actually said, and I, I, I really don't see how you reconcile the ever increasing centralization of power uh, with, and I just meant economic power there uh, with having a high rate of growth. I was grateful that they allowed me to leave the country uh, after I said that. Uh, but I've been I've been saying this uh, for a long time. And, and I have to say, you have to have the utmost respect for the, what the Chinese authorities have done over the past uh, 30 years and what the growth has been. And sort of famously in the case of, you know, Japan, People make predictions uh, that they're going to have inflation someday, and it never happens. I, by the way, predict that. Uh, it's called the widow maker trade because uh, it just never proves true. And that's kind of been the case with saying China would slow down. China would have a problem. It just you know, doesn't ever seem to be true. And, and they've kept the, the growth going, I think, longer than anyone thought possible. But, you know, you've heard versions of this statement many times, but the famous Herbert, you know, Simon statement that my thesis, uh, late thesis advisor, Rudy Dornbush often quotes, which is, you know, things that seem like they can't go on forever, last longer than you think. And when they end, they fall faster than you think. And that may, may be what, uh, what we'll see here, but certainly... The housing prices that you saw are clearly part, they're partly predicated on all kinds of things the government does to force investment into housing, but they're certainly also predicated on this notion that growth is just going to go on and on and on. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't know the, uh, I don't know the uh, answer to that. And I recently did a, uh, uh, I, I did an event with a leading Chinese economist who said, you know, growth next year might even be 8%. I, I, I guess I won't argue with him, except I'd like to see what in 10 years 
people say the growth was next year, as opposed to what the official number is next year. I'm, you know, uh, we'll 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 see. So I, I mentioned one of the uh, pushback that we got was that there was a, a regional mismatch. Uh, one of it was that the tier one cities were doing great, and I think people uh, here's here's a list of the tier one and tier two cities. Uh, the Chinese uh, national statistics list there, I think, is being 685 cities in 2020. Um, so I think what's surprising to people, what really uh, people don't know, you kind of you should, but they don't, is that the Chinese tier three cities, which we're calling everything that's not tier one and tier two, account for a very large percent of GDP. Uh, our calculation from our paper and using the national statistics yearbooks uh, puts it at 60% of GDP. So it's not just, I think, what a lot of people thought is, ah, well, the prices are high in the big cities and demand is strong in the big cities, but who, the little cities don't really matter. They don't add up to that much. That's not the case in China. So and, uh, I have my... Uh, a terrific colleague, David Yang, here moderating this, another terrific colleague I have in the economics department, Javier, Javier Quebec. And he wrote a famous paper about Ziff's law uh, and mentioned how it applied to cities. So Ziff's law roughly says that I think, uh, you know, the uh, uh, size of cities uh, de uh, decreases, uh, the, the um, size of cities decreases roughly log linearly with their rank, roughly with a coefficient of one. That is a very famous regression, true for a lot of countries. It's less true for China. So in other words, uh, you know, New York is much bigger than Los Angeles, which is much bigger than Chicago, et cetera. And China has, uh, I think, fought that. Now, whether it's through the Haku, Haku passes, whatever it is, part of how they've tried to do it is by building a lot of real estate and a lot of infrastructure in the tier three cities, make it attractive. And I think what we're going to see is, although they've done that, the, uh, this isn't our paper, but it's sort of clear the good jobs have not come and the people are not being attracted as was hoped. And the I, I think the intuition, by the way, about trying to fight Ziff's law, it makes some sense to me that there's overcrowding in the biggest cities and you want to spread people out, but they're very powerful economic forces uh, pushing against that. Uh, it's actually 78% uh, of the housing stock is in the tier three cities. And a thing I, I've learned over the course of this project, which shouldn't have surprised me is that this this is also true by value it is not uh, I'm sorry by that by construct if you just look at the construction costs by value because China has very strict national policies about the quality of housing being built in tier three cities has to be to the same very high standards um uh, someone came up to me and mentioned uh Justin Lin who's uh, was chief economist at the World Bank and a celebrated uh, Chinese economist. I remember uh, visiting him at Beijing University a long time ago, and he was explaining to me when China builds roads anywhere in the country, you have to be able to land a 747 on them. That, that was what there was back then. Uh, they built to very high standards. And the same thing is true of housing. Um, so uh, uh, there, uh, you know, we've constructed home to income prices. I've already, uh, talked about that. One of the indicators that we had, uh, in this, having this paper and starting to be talked about is how much unfinished construction there is. So we measure it here by how much, uh, has been, how, uh, how much is under construction in any year versus how much was completed. And we explain in the paper how we calculate this. Now, if you're a really fast growing market, your building's just increasing, increasing. So the housing under construction could be much bigger than the housing that you've completed in any given year. 
I guess in a normal situation, it would take a couple of years to finish a house. But you can see these ratios get up towards 10 and 11. And they're starting to creep uh, uh, articles in the newspapers. They're not looking at aggregate statistics as we are here, but they're finding all these construction projects that have been abandoned uh, and people who I think you have to often pay half or even pay everything in advance and people are complaining about it. Uh, oh, it's not working, but this is. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to skip in the interest of time how we calculated uh, the housing stock. But I will say we do a year by year analysis that uh, actually we're able to make match up to the every 10 year uh, census calculation. And uh, as part of doing our calculation, we need to make an assumption about depreciation. So how much have you built and what was depreciation? And uh, we use uh, 70 years for new construction and 50 years for existing houses. And to the extent those are, I think, probably on the pessimistic side, if you really look at how realistic, how long housing gets used, it means that the housing they have is, is even larger. So um, again, in the interest of time, I'm not, oops, but I don't want to skip this. So uh, something uh, that we, we form a measure of the price drop in the tier three cities. And we do this by using this measure that's quite tediously constructed of floor space. There's no data on tier, there's, we don't have data on tier three cities, but we do have data on tier one and tier two. And I should mention a lot of the tier two data for the 31 countries uh, that the uh, 30, for the uh, 31 cities we have there, we have to go to the provincial, we meaning Yuan Chan, because I don't read Chinese, uh, have to go to the provincial data in order to pull this out. So they publish data on tier one, and we can find data on tier two, but there's also a national measure. And we're able to form our estimate of what's going on in tier three by using the weighted average floor spaces that we uh, calculate for tier one and tier two. And it shows quite a significant drop since uh, 20, uh, 2021. So just in two years, a 20% drop. And that, that's from the official numbers, which based on my experience of looking at housing price data all, all over the world, often significantly lag what is actually going on. Uh, you can also, oops, here, this works. You can also look at uh, the total value of housing uh, by city tier. Uh, this is in, uh, uh, in uh, Yuan, uh, so tier three has dropped. It's only dropped by 15% because there's still, this is the value of the housing. So over the time that the housing's going down in price, they're still adding to the quantity. <laughs> so, um, I think, as I, I mentioned, uh, so so our paper has a demand and a demand element to it that I'm not going to go over. We follow UN projections and Chinese projections to see what the demand for housing is. And there's some other scholars who've done this and we sort of follow in their footsteps in doing this. We estimate that overall the demand for uh, construction services is going to decline about three percent a year. Uh, through the year 2035, uh, but it could be larger in the tier three cities. Now there, there, there's still a demand for replacement. Um, we estimate that of the construction going forward, actually a lot's gonna be replacement because they built a lot. In fact, a little more than half, uh, but uh, even so that's a pr pretty substantial shrinkage. And you can see in the tier three cities, people aren't moving in the good jobs have not been coming and they're actually uh, experiencing a fall in, uh, recently. Um, so very well known to all of you. Uh, so this isn't, uh, again, but we do this by tier, is that Chinese cities are very dependent on, on land revenue, land sales to support themselves. I. There are many scholars in here who know much more than I do about this, uh, not least my co-author, but 
uh, the center just doesn't allow them to have a lot of um, taxing power. And so this whole land boom has been central to how local governments finance themselves. And in fact, when real estate prices fall, it's not just the local banks that are going to suffer, but a lot of the local governments are really going to be in trouble. And we can talk about what some of the solutions are to this. An obvious thing would be to have property taxes, although it must be noted, as again, you well know, that in China, you don't own the land that your house is built on. So it's a little confusing uh, to know how to do that. Um, uh, the housing sectors, uh, very important to employment. I, I won't try to interpret this graph uh, because this is actually about total construction employment, but a lot of it is in the tier three cities. Uh, let me just, uh, before I sort of close my remarks and go to Q&A, mention that I've been talking about housing. It's just the same and worse probably for commercial real estate. One follows the other. Our data on real estate is actually a lot of it combining housing and commercial real estate. And many of the lending, even though some of the housing is financed by the unfortunate individuals who put their life savings into these tier, tier three houses, a lot of the commercial real estate is really financed by local governments and banks. And I let's just say pretty sure that they're in huge trouble uh, if prices aren't going up and it's acute in the tier three cities. We uh, also can make the same comments about infrastructure. I don't think I, I don't, yeah, uh, well, I'll just go to this, uh, of how much is in the tier three cities, a huge percent of roads, uh, uh, new road construction. We also look at uh, water pipes and other measures. There's a lot of infrastructure going on accompanying this. And it's it's been the go-to stimulus policy in the in the Chinese. Um, so uh, the, the this is sort of giving the key messages from our newer paper. So will there be a Western style financial crisis? It's it's easy to there are arguments why that won't happen, but on the other hand, trying to digest such a big transition from being this very real estate and infrastructure focused economy to something that's more balanced is I think going to be very difficult to do. You can retrain the construction workers, you can shift things around, but that's hard to do. Most economies suffer for a long time in that transition. So even if uh, China finds a smooth exit from this, it still could, just at a minimum, slow growth a lot. We we give an estimate in our first paper that a, the demand for uh, final demand for real estate services were to fall by, uh, uh, you know, uh, something like twenty percent. You still could get a couple percent a year fall just from that without any uh, financial crisis for quite a while. And uh, let me let me just uh, can. Uh, conclude there and forgive me for repeating it but these remarks are mine uh, and do not represent the international monetary fund even though i have a co-author from the international monetary fund On the top of that, local governments in China were charged to spend 85% of the fiscal center, they only taking 35% of the fiscal center, so all these short of money. And then revenue, as you have shown, has been the primary source of revenue for them. Now, had that not been sort of dissolved and restructured, uh, the local government's demand for using land to be more possible, always to be, uh, of course, 
and what's your view on what's the way out of this? And then sort of like it's one restructuring of the physical system. So I, I think, David, you're given why this isn't just a question of shifting people out of construction. There, so just as Japan built bridges to nowhere, if I can say something provocatively, China's building houses and apartments nobody lives. And even in China, you know, at some point, it's hard to sell these things when no one, there's no demand. And it's a profound problem, governance problem that China has on how to provide revenues. Uh, so, you know, the, I'm sure no more than I do, but, you know, some of the solutions I'm seeing proposed are going to sacrifice revenues uh, and transfer more revenues. Takes and taxes and kind of the long things down. Uh, I mentioned property tax. I mean, it's that's been politically fought in China to try to do that, but they, that they may have to do that. It does have the problem that you don't own the land and then pay tax on it. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose you can try to just force people to live in these houses and pay a lot for them. But the problem is you can build the infrastructure, but if you don't have water to dance in the economy, if you're just really good at building infrastructure, that's not creating jobs to fulfill these cities. Well, I think one, one, one quick sort of upgrading is the mention of property tax. Um, the proposal of property tax is being tied out in many Tier one cities for, for about a decade and there's a lot of resistance. In particular, it means that it's a tier two city, but it means that the land is probably like some others, but they don't have much say in, in the process. So it's, it's but on the other hand, and you mentioned sort of the, I think the one of the other shocking um, sort of uh, a number that you show is the tier two cities, the size of the region of the region. The biggest beneficiaries of the organization in China had been Central Carolina and Parkland, so two cities for the most people in the region. Um, so I'm wondering what's your thought about to the extent from local governments provided in the city, where are the market people doing It's supposed to be for people who are now are left behind in the rural area, which many of them are not in the labor market, or the chair two city gets into the business competing with their two city to attract the talents and attract more people in the world. I think I think it's sort of a, I think it's sort of a question of what any individual city could be near tier three. And I guess this is like you know, I'm thinking of the football leagues in Europe, you can kind of want to move up then so when they can get into the first premier league and you can get booted down to the lower league and there's competition at the margin. But I don't know that in an environment of shrinking population, there is a solution that the fundamental problem is China is overbuilt and they do have better infrastructure than us. I mean, it's like ridiculously better, but they're decreasing returns to it. And so, you know, how do you how do you keep generating growth? How, how do you shift demand? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you change their economy? It's I, I don't have any to do it. Let me pull, let me throw in one more part. Uh, it's going to be more complicated. We're, we're talking about COVID, zero COVID policy. Kind of not going to probably go away. <laughs> and government is trying their hard to put uh, to work on something given COVID, zero COVID policy really is this effective zero COVID policy. Um, on the other hand, you have the wealth stock in the housing sector increasing for the community residents. That's probably the service process. That's the overall world. And ways and you see this as one of the meaning of sugar than a sort of Well, I think that question answers itself. There was one thing I forgot to say that I meant to, but I just sort of that prompted me to say. I, I see a lot of people write that the reason China's prices are going down is the government cracked down on borrowing a construction companies, many of which are going into bankruptcy, not just ever ran. And other, otherwise, it, everything would be hunky dory, uh, everything would be booming. And I think, our, going back to our 2020 paper, we challenged that view. It's yes, the government has a lot of control, but they can't 
you know, create this incredible imbalance in the economy between everything else that kind of real estate. And that that really is about lending policies and uh, and uh, financial policies. Um, I, I mean the uh, the, the zero the zero COVID policies if it ended tomorrow, clearly there'd be some huge boost in growth right away. Or I would mean, guess out of euphoria, just just like we had here in Europe. Uh, but I I don't think it would make this problem go away. I I, I think the problem is you know if you look at the size and how much they built and where their income is, so it's that imbalance that you, you, the center can push at the margin for a while, but just not forever. So you know, there, are, there, are many, there are many challenges China faces on water, environmental degradation, demographics, slowing productivity, centralization. I think of the property sector as an amplifier because when it slows down, Suddenly, this all comes tumbling like a house of cards. And uh, so, what seemed like it might be a slow moving problem when growth slows becomes a fast moving problem. And I, I think that's what's going to happen. And you can suppress it, but not all that much. I mean, there's lots of pretty centralized the economies, not one economy, instead of running to the fitness law. All right, let me open. To the floor. Anyone has questions? Maybe just introduce yourself. You've got a microphone coming your way. No, oh, sorry. I just said that. Here, here. Okay. 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 Don't go first. Go first. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Theo Shell. I'm an economist, but not trained in policy. Uh, I'd like to go back to the, uh, thank you very much, Ken, for a uh, very thorough and factual based analysis. And it's enlightened us a great deal. Uh, I'd like to follow up on the question about structure, the structural cause for this phenomenon that will actually shape how China could get out of it. And my question are two parts. From the obvious uh, causes is because the tier three cities generate their revenue by selling land, leasing out the land. That's really how Shanghai generate its resources to modernize and build up Shanghai and other city actually emulated. The second reason is China has a very weak financial market. So people do not have other avenues to channel their domestic savings. So one is actually the government promotes development because they land sales, and then people don't have the financial market. If, I'd like to hear your comment whether that those reasons are valid or not. If they are valid, then how could China get out of this current situation? But those are excellent points, and they kind of explain uh, why you're seeing the price uh, income ratios in China at a level that can't even be imagined in other parts of the world particularly that there's not another place to put your money. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, there have to be some uh, either explicit or implicit rental value to these properties to justify the prices. And if you believe China was going to grow at 6% forever, much less 8% forever, it's actually quite reasonable uh, that you could get very, very high prices. But if that's not the case, the two things interact. And that, I think that's really what it works. So of it. And I think in the tier three cities, you point to the local governments, but I, I think it's actually something, okay, speculate completely, but probably the central government wanted to see the building. 
They did not want to see everyone move into uh, Beijing and Shanghai. If you look at some of the other great cities of the world, and I think and I'm thinking of Calcutta, San Paulo, uh, these were these were thriving cities that just got a crush of people moving into them and they couldn't handle it. And it's very reasonable to say if we have a lot of state control. I, it's not something I've ever, you know, I, I'm talking a very sympathetic to the thought they had. We have a lot of state control. Let's fight Zip's law, which is that people tend to congregate in the fatal city. Let's resist it. Let's give incentives for it not to happen. And <clears throat> Yeah, but it, it hasn't worked on the employment side, is basically the problem. And uh, maybe there's a solution to it. And if, if there is a solution to it, I suppose China will find it. But it's not, you know, I think it's easy. Good to, I'm so happy to be here and thank you for the very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, I'm, I'm Grace Chen from uh, MIT Sloan. I'm Andrea Pinke over there. So I kind of wonder, um, what does this whole thing mean to Chinese people who own a house, for example, my parents, or uh, just imagine a general common uh, middle class in China who has, let's say, 50 to 70 percent of their asset are in poverty. What should they do? Um, should they sell their house or downgrade into a smaller one or like no action? And what? And how would that differ, be different from tier one, tier two, tier three cities? Well, I mean, you're very constrained on what you could do with the money if you sold your house, is sort of the problem. But that's not so straightforward because they could not get alternatives. But I think it's probably fair to say, we even said we've been in China for three years. I think it's fair to say that most people are quite worried about the value of their house and the whole concept that it could only go up, up and could never go down, much as Americans learned in 2008 and I'm sad to say are learning again now. Um, that's just not true. Right? So it's hard to know about it, but it's a major problem for people. It's a major problem for the government. <laughs> uh, it's, it, it, I think in terms of uh, social stability, it's a massive issue. I mean, you've got to, you know, we, I don't want to go there about what will happen, but I would say people are going to be pretty unhappy about it. Um, hi, my name is Jim Chen. I'm an associate in research at the Fairbank Center. And we have a common friend um, that we both know, Bob Oliver. You remember? Of course. Um, and I remember about even 20 years ago, close to 20 years ago, when Bob Oliver, another financial economist, um, was talking about China's real estate like, situation. And back then, almost 18 years ago, his pitch was almost exactly the same as yours, except he was not overwhelmingly concerned with tier three of cities. He was not explicit about that. And he, his analysis of the real estate sector, price to income ratio, price to, to rent ratio, um, was resembled your analysis very much. Um, and he was drawing more or less the same conclusion as you do. And this reminds me of um, what Dorn Bush said, we'll anticipate some, something going to happen for a long time, and, long, and it's not going to happen it's, it, it happens, it takes longer time than you think it would happen. And once it happens, it happens faster than you think it would. Um, so, so it seems to me that what's changed, what changed between 18 years, let's say 18 years ago to now, is more of degree rather than uh, qualitative difference from a decade ago. And the problem is more severe than a decade ago or 18 years ago. But the qualitative factors um, have not changed much in the sense that the government still has control of the banking situation. Still has control, the capital market is not open. Um, capital transactions are not open. Foreign capital cannot easily go in and out of the country. And um, Chinese residents' savings 
and bottled up inside the master world. And therefore, the patients have all the savings. So if they want to, if they choose to keep the policy scene going, they could, uh, it seems to me, it could last for a while. And especially if uh, Xi Jinping uh, stays in control and keeps tighter and tighter control, both politically and economically. Um, and it seems to me it could uh, last longer given the fundamental structure uh, that has remained more or less the same from the uh, from a decade ago. Um, so well, I mean, call it. Bob Alifer is a brilliant man, so uh, happy that I'm echoing things he thought. So, yeah, clearly, if you look over the last 18 years, no one would have predicted China would have done so well. I mean, that, that they've just done two standard deviations better than anyone thought it. it's lasted longer, that they haven't had a crash is stunning. And that, that, that is consistent with the housing prices, too. But they are having a crash now. After the summer, and prices are falling. This is really that happened before. And once they start falling, and people see they're falling, the same dynamic that makes you know everyone have the bubble mentality that they're going to go up forever, it, it, it changes. It. So that's that is a tough thing to push back against. Uh, even for a central control economy, they 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 can try to keep the lid on information. Uh, I think it was a paper published in 2016 or 17 by a Princeton professor that had some data on vacancy rates uh, in China that now um, maybe no better data seems to be a state secret of uh, what's going on with the vacancy rates in different parts of China. I, it would reinforce it as um, something probably that. But uh, of course, you never know. I mean, I'm not sure about it. I, I will say we wrote our first paper a couple of years ago before this had started happening and when it wasn't the consensus. And I think the consensus has moved in this direction, but the consensus could be wrong. I think we're going to add one to the other part. It's, it's, it's more than there was a recent uh, article on this that showing that at a few times during the last 10 years, we kind of broke um, where we're in Solomon Gross with it the This is a tangent, but I thought it was interesting that delayed public thing, the third quarter's GDP number. Uh, that when we the preliminary the couple of days ago, and like when delayed. And initial GDP numbers, I think the US in Taiwan. Uh, they're, you're, you know, these are seeing the same right after it happens. This is, is a guess, but the fact that they delay the number tells me that the guess. So we've got a question from the our online audience, if I may. Um, do you think that this is probably for both of you? Uh, do you think the recent policies regarding rural revitalization are related to the overbuild? Is it an excuse to build more infrastructure or a solution to the overbuilt challenge? Something that's been going on for a long time. That has been the policy to try to make it more attractive to stay in the rural earth. And again. You know, if you're looking at it as a central planner, even at the United States, we have the same problem. Our small and medium-sized cities have just gotten emptied out, and it's a disaster because it ends up there are no jobs, and you know many of the uh, stresses and frankly political problems we have come from this. So I'm very sympathetic to it, but I think what we learned from the Chinese experience so far is just building roads and hospitals and and uh, 
bridges and apartment buildings is not enough. It, they're somehow networking that you get in big cities, whether it's social, whether it's uh, coming from uh, reaction that you get uh, among companies is very important. And our, our, we again, we have many colleagues in the economics departments, but particularly at Blazer, uh, it's the best director of our urban studies program. We're going to talk this a lot. Um, we've also heard a lot about um, maybe advocating affordable housing could be a solution. We know that this is also a problem facing China, um, mainly in, in many tier one and two cities. Um, and we also have to miss out on the problem you talk about between the different tier cities um, and accessibility. Uh, my question is that uh, what do you think about the overall? Overall, how the affordable housing issues could add up to the solutions or problems to this crisis, or your comments on maybe how they are or not are not able to use it as a tool to maybe slow down the collapsing process. We've heard a lot about the voices of advocating um, affordable housing. Affordable housing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the question that I'm uh, My question is just uh, what do you think about overall how the affo affordable housing issues may lead to one to two cities and the misallocation problem between the accessibility in different tier cities uh, could add up to the solutions or problems related to this crisis or your comments on maybe how they are able or are not able to use it as a tool to maybe slow down the collapse of the crisis. So we sure if you're well aware, uh, housing stocks are very equally there are some people who need houses and they bought them for their children, they their children, some people then it is met questions, you know, how do you square the circle? Uh, how do you uh, you know that work? Um, and how do you make it economic? You can certainly provide affordable housing. I hate to pick on California, but I love to pick on California. I'm sure you've read about what they've done in Los Angeles for their homeless problem. They build in units that have cost five hundred thousand to a million dollars uh, per house in order to provide for five thousand homeless or something in California. And I don't know, I don't think I have to explain why, you know, that involves a lot of taxes and changes. But I mean, there, there are many instruments, but at the end of the day, they have already built a lot of houses. The question how to reallocate. Do they, if people have eight houses, do they tell them they have enough five houses to get three or Maybe all this can be done under particular, under sufficiently powerful central government. Although good luck having three percent flow environment where you're dealing with things like that, uh, much less have five or six percent flow. There's a lot. New York City had rent control, which is a basically season property, and some economies have done that and benefit some people and other people, but it's not good for it's not good for growth. So, I taught at Berkeley, California for a while, which had a very strong rent control system. That's a way of trying to allocate out of the affordable housing. But it's uh, difficult, yeah, it's difficult to make it sustainable. There are definitely things they can and should do, but they're not easy, special if you're really depending on growing at four or five percent and becoming a giant superpower. It's not easy to reconcile massive redistribution with high growth, very high growth. I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's very difficult. Thank you. I'm a, I'm my name is George. Um, so, um, scientists. 
chilling past it. So, but I just want to see on the flip side, do you think we have a reason that would have this attractiveness of being a positive side of it? Do you think that factors like resources that you think 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 that yeah, well, I mean, the uh, I think the I, I saw a study in uh, finance and development where the uh, well back by David Dollar, at least he's one of the co-authors about product estimating productivity. And they had estimates of what happened from 2015, maybe 2013 to 2019. It has collapsed measures of productivity. Uh, for, for a long time, China made you know, a lot of China's growth just comes from investment. Economists call productivity when you're getting more out of the same amount of resources. That's the kind of thing. And it's, China needs to regenerate that with its continued growth because otherwise investment runs into decreases of earnings. I don't think that's do it. I think every economy is going to this product with having massive investment. Forget about, you know, not just Russia, Japan, Singapore, uh, all the uh, other Asian economies, Korea, they all hit a wall on this. And the argument's been given that this time it's different, China won't, but I think it is. I mean, of course, we, we, we need to, you need to do this in Asia. You know, their productivity has collapsed for, for lots of reasons. It's not just China. That's a chance. It's a challenge. And again, I hesitate to say what the Chinese leaders can and can't do after producing this expansion of China in the last few years. But we've argued, and I think it's pretty compelling that we can keep China as it. I've noticed in the past few months, uh, people sort of uh, taking our title. And just saying we took peak China. I don't know if I agree with that, but we're, our paper's about peak China. <laughs> well, we're, we're unfortunately out of time. I want to end with inviting choir. Do we have one to think about any optimistic uh, thing you want to follow? And with that. Well, I mean, I think it's phenomenal what kind of done. Every country who's had a big boom like this. Has had to go, go through a period where they've got a lot to, it's just hard to be, you know, perfect all the time. So I'm, I could put in view this as a there's an absolute phenomenon. Uh, but they can't keep doing it the way they've been doing it, like everybody else. And, and there's probably going to be a period that's much worse than that. Like everyone else. In, in the, uh,